Tonight, breaking news, the deadly tornado outbreak moving east, millions bracing for severe weather. At least 20 tornadoes ripping through the south, funnel clouds tearing across highways, sending people running for cover. A pickup truck tossed by the wind like a toy. A 73-year-old woman killed in her home and the damage at an elementary school nearly bringing the police chief to tears. What he told our Morgan Chesky, 10 million still in the path of the dangerous storm, Al Roker, standing by with the forecast. Also breaking tonight, Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson making her case. The Supreme Court nominee grilled by senators in a marathon hearing, pressed on hot button issues like Roe versus Wade. The tense moments with Senator Ted Cruz, a former law school classmate over sentencing in child pornography cases. Peter Alexander at the White House tonight. Plus, stopping the siege, Ukraine launching a counteroffensive, pushing back Russia and forces circling the capital city. Again, it's under a curfew. New drone footage showing a factory bombed in Mariupol, that city bearing four weeks of relentless attacks. And Putin's top critic, Alexei Navalny, in court today, the sentence handed down as Russia looks to silence dissidents. Shoved to death, a 26-year-old turning herself in to the NYPD. She's charged in the death of a beloved Broadway vocal coach, accused of not Knocking the 87-year-old to the ground, that woman later dying from her injuries. So what sparked the violent encounter? Saget's final moments, police releasing new images of the hotel room where beloved actor Bob Saget was found dead. One image showing the padded headboard authorities say he might have hit his head on as the circumstances surrounding his death remain a mystery. Plus tonight, the chilling 911 calls just released and bounce house danger. High High winds sending the inflatable flying, going airborne, nearly striking a little kid just inches away. Top story starts right now. And good evening. A busy night of breaking news here at home and abroad. And we begin top story tonight with that deadly tornado outbreak slamming the south. The powerful images, you see them right behind me, coming in right now, showing the full wrath of this storm. This as millions more are bracing for impact. A tornado coming dangerously close to a Walmart in Round Rock, Texas. High winds and swirling debris sending shoppers running for cover. And another Texas twister tearing across the highway, Tossing around a pickup truck, you see it right there, that driver miraculously able to pull away to safety. Communities across Texas and Oklahoma waking up to this devastation. The winds ripping off the roof of this high school gym where hundreds of teachers and students were sheltering. And that storm is not done yet. 10 million people still under a severe weather alert as the storm targets the East Coast. Al Roker has that forecast in just a moment. But first, Morgan Chesky is live on the ground in Texas at a second school that suffered a direct hit. He leads us off tonight. Tonight, devastation in Texas from a string of storms now striking across the south. Nobody needs to be on the highway right now. Mississippi on high alert after a deadly 24 hours in Texas. The twister shredding homes, tossing cars, get inside, get inside. and sending many scrambling to take shelter. One tornado striking during rush hour Monday, crossing a busy I-35, unfolding on live TV. Tornado on the ground right now. Another close call capturing the storm, rolling a red pickup truck, then tossing it back onto the road, somehow letting the driver speed to safety. In Jacksboro, about two hours west of Dallas, a suspected tornado ripped the roof off the high school, but it was a direct hit on the elementary that nearly brought police chief Scott Haynes to tears. I was one of the first responders here. With the school caving in, his biggest fear, the almost 400 students and teachers caught inside. I know you don't want to dwell on it, but how easily it could have gone the other way. There could have been a lot of casualties just out of this one structure here in, in Jacksboro. The chief leading us down the debris strewn hallway where he checked the school's safe room. To immediately make entry into the room and then have kids grabbing your leg and holding on to you and stuff like that, it was just a good feeling. In what he calls a miracle, every student and teacher walked away unscathed as the now deadly storm system marches on. 
All right, Morgan Chesky joins us now live from Jacksboro, Texas. Morgan, it's incredible that everyone survived in that school. You mentioned there how miraculous that was. You spoke with the police chief, and it's just truly stunning when you see the structure behind you. Did that police chief have any sense of why all those lives were saved? Essentially, what prevented that collapse from turning catastrophic? Yeah, Tom, he did. In fact, he pointed out to a key piece of the design of this school. And as we pull out, you'll get a sense of just the extent of the damage. But beyond this, on the other side is what they call a safe hallway. And that is where these teachers and their students were ushered into in those final minutes before this storm struck. Tom, I spoke to a young student. He tells me the teachers had them facing the lockers, hands behind their head. And he said he had his little brother under one arm and he told him, just close your eyes. Uh, this will be OK as this storm struck and they heard this portion of the building start to collapse around them. Whenever we walked in that hallway with the police chief, it was one of the few areas in this building uh, that was relatively untouched. And that is how nearly 400 teachers and students were able to walk out of this mess unscathed. Tom. All right, Morgan Chesky leading us off with that breaking news, and we're tracking those severe storms on the move tonight. Al Roker again on Top Story joining us now. Al, how's this timing out? Well, we're now seeing, Tom, these, these tornado watches move to the east. Now we've got Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, tornado warnings now popping up as well as this system really vigorously moves east. We do have a moderate risk of severe tornadoes and weather for 10 million people, damaging hail, wind gusts, of up to 75 miles per hour. And then Wednesday, we get into the Ohio River Valley and the southeast for 27 million people. Damaging winds, hail, and tornadoes are possible. Here's the system on the move. So for tonight, overnight, this cold front pushes those storms across the Gulf Coast into the mid-Tennessee River Valley. Extreme rainfall uh, rates upwards of one to two inches. It could be falling per hour in some spots. Tomorrow, the heavy rain enters the mid-Atlantic up into the northeast, but that severe risk continues down into the southeast. And we've got a flash flood risk, a moderate risk for much of Mississippi, Alabama, all and a slight risk all the way up into the Tennessee River Valley. We're talking rainfall anywhere from one to three inches to four inches, but Tom, we could see some isolated totals, six inches or more, and that is going to cause some real flash flooding risks. So you put that on top of the tornadoes, the next 24 hours are still going to be pretty perilous. Tom? All right, Al, I know you and your team will be tracking that through the Today Show tomorrow. We thank you for that. We now head overseas to our other big breaking story. We're following, of course, the war in Ukraine and the escalating assaults on key cities. The port city of Mariupol, isolated and under siege as the Kremlin steps up its own crackdown of critics. NBC News chief foreign correspondent reporting again from Ukraine, Richard Engel. With Kyiv under a total curfew, Ukrainian troops today went on the offensive, using hit-and-run tactics to drive back Russian troops from the capital. Ukraine's main objective now is to prevent Russian forces from encircling Kyiv, like they did to Mariupol. This new drone video released by Ukraine appears to show Russian strikes on factories and industrial buildings. And these new satellite images reveal smoke rising above the besieged city, still cut off with hundreds of thousands of people without food and water. Ukraine's President Zelensky is calling for an immediate summit with Russian President Putin. Zelensky today spoke by video link to Italy's parliament, calling for more sanctions against Russia after criticizing the U.S. and NATO for not acting with sanctions sooner, which he says could have prevented the invasion. Meanwhile, Russia released new video of its attack on a shopping mall in Kyiv this week, insisting Ukraine was using it as a site to launch missiles and store ammunition. Russia has met fierce resistance from Ukrainians across the country. And now, for the first time today, a senior U.S. defense official says Russia has lost more than 10 percent of its combat power in Ukraine. But increasingly, resistance is also inside Russia, and the Kremlin is trying to crush it. A Russian court today sentenced Putin's top critic, Alexei Navalny, to nine more years in a maximum security prison allegedly for fraud. Navalny supporters say the charges are simply a way to keep Putin's enemy off the streets.
Tom, almost from the beginning of this war, we've heard about Russian shortages, that they lack food and fuel. Well, tonight a U.S. military official said that some Russian troops have had to be pulled out of the fight because they lack cold weather gear and have been suffering from frostbite. Tom? Frostbite, almost hard to believe. All right, Richard Engel for us tonight. Richard, thank you. I want to bring in Ambassador John Herbst. He's the director of the Eurasia Center at the Atlantic Council and the former U.S. ambassador to Ukraine under President George W. Bush. Ambassador, I got to ask you about that last part there that Richard just mentioned about this frostbite. How can a, a superpower, if you will, like Russia, and maybe superpower is not the, the right word to use there, but how can a, a country like Russia that has one of the most powerful militaries in the world be committing sort of all all these errors you would think of a country maybe not unlike the one they've just invaded because they were overly confident that they would win easily look some of his troops may have frostbite because keep in mind they were cut out in the field for a month starting back in, in October and so they were out in the field the entire winter and they're out in the field not fighting for three and a half four months before they actually launched their invasion of Ukraine so that, that itself yeah, go ahead, Ambassador. Sorry, go ahead. Well, that, that weakened the troops as they went into action. And, of course, they had a, they had a very uh, short, narrow-minded strategic plan to go after all cities of Ukraine throughout the entire country when they didn't have the forces to sustain it. They expected the Ukrainians to, the Ukrainians to fold rather than to fight. And once the Ukrainians began to fight effectively, they were stuck. So the Russians have made no gains over the past week. Ambassador, I want to ask you now about uh, President Zelensky's comments, his call for this summit. Do you see any scenario where Vladimir Putin actually sits down with the leader of Ukraine? Well, I don't rule this out at some point in the somewhat distant future when Putin realizes he has no military option. But right now, he's, everything he says suggests he wants unconditional surrender by the Ukrainians. And there's no interest in Ukraine in doing that, and they don't need to because, in fact, their military is doing a more— a very effective job defending the country. You know, we know President Biden is leaving for Europe tomorrow for that highly anticipated summit. So many people are talking about the NATO summit. It's later this week. And then he'll be heading to Poland. You've been critical of the Biden administration's response to the Russian invasion so far. What are your hopes for the president's trip? Look, the Biden administration deserves credit for seeing that the invasion was coming and laying out the different instruments they have to stop that to deter it or now to stop it. The problem with the administration is they've been rather slow and timid in actually following their own game plan. They should have sent far more weapons and more advanced weapons to Ukraine before Russia invaded. Even now, they're dawdling on sending high-altitude anti-aircraft systems to Ukraine, anti-ship missiles to Ukraine. We've sent just 100 short-range drones. We're sending longer-range drones in greater quantities. We need to make it clear to the Kremlin they have no military option. Instead, they, they get concerned about, quote, unquote, escalation. Yes, we don't want escalation, but weakness rather than strength is more likely to tell Russians they can get away with, escal with escalating themselves. Ambassador, on that point, if you could explain to, to me and to our viewers, since you're a diplomat, I mean, I mean, what is the calculation? Why are some weapons okay and other weapons are not? Why are some drones okay and other drones are not? Well, I think they're spending far too much time worrying about how Putin might consider one weapon system or the other. I don't think that Putin finds high-altitude anti-aircraft missiles far more dangerous than the Javelins, which are destroying his tanks, or the Stingers, which are destroying his helicopters. Um, and keep in mind, he's using his entire military arsenal, except for weapons of mass destruction, to destroy a people. His military is unable to defeat Ukraine's military, so they're trying to kill Ukrainian civilians with massive bombardments and with using of weapons which are outlawed, like thermobar vacuum bombs and like cluster bombs. We, need to, we were able to deter Moscow during the Cuban Missile Crisis, even though the Soviet Union was far stronger than, the, than Russia is today. We were far less timid then. We need to be less timid now. We need to defend our interests, which means defeating Russia, helping Ukraine defeat Russia in Ukraine with American weapons. Ambassador Herbst, we thank you for joining Top Story, as always. Hello. And tonight, as Russian troops are closing in on several cities, millions of Ukrainians are digging in for a lengthy fight. And now others who have already made it to safety in neighboring countries are choosing to return and help with the war effort. Gabe Gutierrez has that story. It seems unreal. 
It's become a bleak existence. This is the dark, frigid basement where a dozen families cram together each night, huddled by candlelight, fueled by defiance. When the bombing is going, then you never know where it will uh, drop. Victoria Felotova works for a charity in Chernihiv. That's in northern Ukraine near Belarus. Russian troops have surrounded the city, but it's hanging on. So are other cities like Mariupol and Kharkiv. This is not the war between Ukraine and Russia. This is the war between light and darkness, between goodness and uh, evil. We are determined to protect our land and to stay here. Many others have not stayed. More from ravaged cities arriving in Lviv today. Natalie is from Kyiv, surrounded by Russian troops on three sides. She decided to get out with her family before it's too late. Others are making the remarkable choice to return. A humanitarian corridor opened up today, and this train is being loaded up with supplies and people who are heading back east to pick up loved ones. This woman is coming back from Poland to care for her sick father in eastern Ukraine. This mother is returning with her young daughter. This is my country, she says firmly. Refugees now top three and a half million. As a volunteer train conductor, Serhi has seen a lot of them. The defiance in places like Mariupol weighs heavily on him. Mariupol right now is a stronghold of freedom. It's a stronghold of the all democracy world. And Gabe joins us again tonight from Lviv. Gabe, you know, I want to talk to you about that train conductor you spoke to. They really are the unsung heroes in this war. They've been carrying refugees for weeks and also transporting humanitarian aid. What is it about these men and women that, that makes them just not stop, not take a day off, and to really take those trains into enemy territory, if you will, where there's fighting, and then to come back with all these refugees? Yeah, Tom, it really is incredible. This young man we spoke with was from Kyiv, but he felt motivated to help his country. We spoke with him. He was helping people on and off the trains and really, uh, you know, helping bring that humanitarian aid into the eastern part of the country. And as you mentioned, he really saw this as a fight for democracy. He said that what was happening in Mariupol right now was shocking him. It was disturbing. And he knew how high these stakes are. Tom. Gabe Gutierrez for us tonight, again from Lviv. Back here at home in Washington, Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson, the first black woman nominee to the U.S. Supreme Court, facing hours of questioning in her day two of her confirmation hearing. Jackson praised by Democrats, grilled by Republicans, and often resisting attempts by both sides to drag her into partisan food fights. Peter Alexander has the late details. Tonight, Judge Katanji Brown Jackson facing at times contentious questioning, vying to become the first black woman on the nation's highest court, describing the kind of justice she would be. My record demonstrates my impartiality. Jackson was preemptively asked by Democrats about Republican accusations that she's soft on crime, noting her brother and uncles served in law enforcement. I know what it's like to have loved ones who go off to protect and to serve and the fear of not knowing whether or not they're going to come home again because of crime in the community. And addressing criticism that her sentences in child pornography possession cases have been too lenient. As a mother and a judge who has had to deal with these cases, I was thinking that nothing could be further from the truth. Republican Ted Cruz then highlighted several cases where Jackson's sentences were shorter than prosecutors recommended. Do you believe the voice of the children is heard when 100% of the time you're sentencing child porno uh, those in possession of child pornography to far below what the prosecutor's asking for? Yes, Senator, I do. Judges don't just calculate the guidelines and stop. Judges have to take into account the personal circumstances of the defendant, because that's a requirement of Congress. Retired federal judges from both parties say most federal judges in these cases sentenced below the guidelines because they consider them out of date. Jackson was also pressed for her views on court packing, the idea promoted by some Democrats to change the balance of the Supreme Court by adding more justices, a move the late Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Stephen Breyer, who Jackson would replace, opposed.
Do you agree with Justice Breyer and Justice Ginsburg that court packing is a bad idea? Well, respectfully, Senator, other nominees to the Supreme Court have uh, responded as I will, which is um, that it is a policy question for Congress. Jackson, who's received bipartisan praise for her experience as a federal public defender, today explaining her work defending Guantanamo Bay detainees. That's what you do as a federal public defender. You are standing up for the constitutional value of representation. Lindsey Graham using questions about Jackson's faith. On a scale of one to 10, how faithful would you say you are in terms of religion? Well, Senator, I am reluctant to talk about my faith in this way. To blast Democrats' treatment of now Justice Amy Coney Barrett in 2020. If a conservative woman wants to stand out and say, I love my family just as much as you love yours, and my faith means just as much to me as it does you, that all of a sudden there comes some kind of weirdo. Jackson was also asked about her views on the Second Amendment. The Supreme Court has established that the individual right to keep and bear arms is a fundamental right. And on landmark abortion rights cases. Roe and Casey are the settled law of the Supreme Court. With her confirmation assured if Democrats stay united, reflecting on the historic nature of her nomination. I have received so many notes and letters and photos from little girls around the country and that they have thought about the law in new ways um, because I am a woman, because I am a black woman. All right, Peter joins us now from the White House. Peter, I have a couple questions for you tonight. The first, I, I want to go back to that exchange with Senator Lindsey Graham because I know there were some other exchanges that were a little more contentious. My question is, we know that Senator Graham confirmed her less than a year ago to a federal appeals court. Is there any sort of thinking that he may have changed his calculation on her? Yeah, Tom, uh, it was Lindsey Graham who was just one of three Senate Republicans who voted to confirm Judge Jackson to the appeals court seat that she sits on right now. And he was particularly contentious in part of that uh, exchange with her today, as well as in the first day of hearings, basically asking why it is that some of the most progressive groups in America have supported her nomination. He, of course, was particular in his support of J. Michelle Childs, a different judge who the president did not select from his home state of South North Carolina. So he certainly did raise some doubts about whether he would support her again today. So as the temperature may be getting a little hotter, what can we expect tomorrow in the second round of questioning? Well, we're going to hear another round of questioning. Some of the some of these senators will have their first opportunity to pose their questions, including Marsha Blackburn, uh, a conservative Republican of Tennessee. But really nothing, Tom, happened today, I think, that appears likely to knock Judge Jackson off of her path to confirmation. And tonight the White House says that it is very satisfied, very pleased with her performance today. Tom. All right, Peter, we thank you for that. We want to turn now to the fatal plane crash in China. Chinese investigators saying they are focused on finding the plane's black boxes to help determine the cause of this crash. Authorities say it appears everyone on board died. NBC News aviation correspondent Tom Costello has more tonight. Buried and scattered across a hillside in southern China, the remains of China Eastern Flight 5735. No survivors, just the personal belongings of the 132 people on board. Chinese investigators now say the Boeing 737-800 was level at 29,000 feet when it suddenly went into a fast and fatal nosedive, slamming into the ground in less than two minutes. Its final seconds captured on a surveillance camera. Chinese authorities today promised to find the cause of the accident as soon as possible. At the Dream Aero Simulator in Maryland, retired Captain Mark Weiss showed us firsthand what those final seconds may have looked like. We're going down it's 6,000 feet a minute now. And it's getting faster and faster. Absolutely. Look at your airspeed. I'm coming back with the throttles. Can you pull out or is it too late? I've got 8,000 feet, but here's the mountains. I just hit the mountains. There's your answer. Think of how many seconds we had. You couldn't pull this out. You just don't have enough strength. The plane's black boxes could answer critical questions. Did the plane suffer a catastrophic mechanical or structural failure? Did the crew respond properly? And even was the crash intentional? Investigators have got to look at the background of this flight crew and what was happening in that cockpit to rule out whether an intentional act 
was involved here. We still just don't know. Boeing says it's cooperating fully with Chinese authorities. The 737-800 has a fantastic stellar safety record. This is not the 737 MAX. However, Boeing having lost two 737 MAXs and dealing with a worldwide fleet that was grounded for more than a year is very much in the spotlight yet again. All right, Tom Costello for us for more analysis on this tragedy. I want to bring in NBC News aviation analyst John Cox to help us try and understand this more. John, my first question to you is when you see the actual video, that dash cam, that surveillance video of the plane just nose diving to that mountain into the ground there, and then you see the simulation that Tom Costello was just in, what goes through your head? The flight profile of this accident is very, very unusual. It's really hard to get the airplane to do what the, the uh, flight data that we've seen so far and that video show. So the question is, what led up to that? And right now, everything's on the table. The thing that uh, goes through my mind the most often is this one is so unusual, it's very um, unlike a uh, an accident type that we see more frequently something unusual happened what was it and we, we will get to the answer um, and everybody wants to do it quickly but it's more importantly to get it right john what do you what do you think was happening inside that plane with the pilot the crew the passengers at that point when the plane's going that fast in that position are, are people passing out do they do, do they know what's going on are they still conscious well, initially, the rate of descent was so great that it's going to be about a lot like a, uh, a roller coaster effect where you would have people up on the ceiling. Uh, people would be uh, pulled out of their seat. Um, it would be very terrifying for them. As far as the pilots, I would certainly assume that they are fighting for control of the aircraft uh, and trying to understand, one, what happened, and two, how to rectify it and to get this upset condition back under control. You know, I know those black boxes are built in a way, those flight data recorders, in a way where, you know, they can survive almost anything. Do they always survive almost anything? I mean, has there ever been a situation because this crash looks so devastating where they wouldn't be able to pull any information out? It's possible to exceed the capability of the airplane to withstand him, or I'm sorry, the recorders to withstand impact. Um, we have been very fortunate. There's been a lot of good technology that has improved the crash worthiness of these recorders. And I'm hopeful. Uh, I, I think we'll find them. Uh, there's a lot of small pieces, but they'll be in a, uh, a general area where um, we can we can find them. And uh, once they, they get them, then they'll be sent to the laboratory and you know, we'll be able to, um, to see what information is, with, uh, is available to be retrieved. And we need that information because it will, it will tell the story. John, real quick, because we may be losing your signal, but I do want to ask you this. Do you, do you, are you confident we will get to the truth even with the Chinese government sort of overseeing what's happening there with, with this investigation? I am because the, the Chinese have agreed to perform this investigation in concert with ICAO Annex 13, which is the worldwide standard for accident investigation, which means the National Transportation Safety Board will be involved, the uh, Boeing, the manufacturer will be involved, uh, uh, General Electric, the manufacturer of the engines, will be involved. If there are avionics issues, the avionics manufacturers will be involved. In addition to the Chinese investigative authority, CAAC, who will be the, the entity that is running the investigation. But I do believe that there will be enough focus and the commitment of the Chinese to follow um, the Annex 13 protocol. So I'm optimistic at this point. Aviation analyst John Cox. John, we thank you for your time. We do want to move on now to the growing controversy in Florida over what critics are calling the Don't Say Gay Bill. Today, some Disney employees walking out of work in protest over the corporation's response to the legislation. But the scene was very different in California than in Florida. Blaine Alexander has those details. 
inside the iconic Walt Disney Studios in Burbank, California. Same game! Same game! Today, dozens of Disney employees walked off the job. Um, you know, out here just in support of all of our here uh, employees and their families. An act of protest over Florida's so-called don't say gay bill. If signed into law, it would ban classroom instruction on sexual orientation or gender identity in Florida in kindergarten through third grade. But a new national poll on the issue shows 51% of those responding support the provision, with 35% against. If you are out protesting this bill, you are by definition putting yourself in favor of injecting sexual instruction to five, six, and seven-year-old kids. I think most people think that's wrong. I think parents especially think that's wrong. Now, inside the happiest place on earth, growing frustration over Disney CEO Bob Chapek's handling of the legislation, with critics saying he did not do enough to speak out against it. At the time, he explained. Now, we were opposed to the bill from the outset, but we chose not to take a public position on it because we thought we could be more effective working behind the scenes. That set off a firestorm, with some launching a website and Twitter page calling for a company-wide walkout. It's launched the House of Mouse into damage control. Today, a slew of statements from Disney properties, ESPN, Hulu, Disney Plus, all reaffirming their commitment to LGBTQ plus rights. You have seen now a number of Disney brands come out on Twitter forcefully rejecting the premise behind the legislation. This was the reaction that Disney could have done from the jump. And if Disney had done this from the jump, uh, you wouldn't be seeing the same level of angst and protest among employees. At an employee town hall Monday, Chapek apologized again and admitted he made a mistake in handling the situation. The company also announced a listening tour, a company-wide task force, and efforts to oppose similar legislation in other states. Is the CEO facing pressure right now? He's absolutely facing pressure. Uh, the board is watching his relationship externally uh, and internally, of course, with employees. Roger that. Adding to the fuel, a new variety report about the new Pixar film, Lightyear. After scrapping a planned kiss between a same-sex couple, Disney is now adding it back to the movie, the magazine reports. All right, Blaine Alexander joins us now from right outside Disney World in the Orlando area, of course, in Florida. Blaine, we saw there in your story a protest at Walt Disney Studios in Burbank, California, but there was a different story on, on what happened where you are there in Orlando. A very different story, Tom. We only saw one employee out here today, so certainly a very different response from what we saw out west. But remember, many of these are union employees, and they were urged by their union leaders to not participate, saying that they could possibly violate their contracts. Tom. Blaine Alexander for us tonight from Orlando. Blaine, we thank you for that. Still ahead tonight, the manslaughter charge after a beloved teacher was shoved to her death. A 26-year-old suspect surrendering to police in New York City weeks after she allegedly knocked an 87-year-old to the ground. Authorities still searching for a connection between the two women. Plus, new details on comedian Bob Saget's final moments, the hotel room photos released by police, and the chilling new 911 calls. And the bounce house going airborne in North Carolina, narrowly missing a child. What happened here? The heart-stopping moment caught on camera. Top story just getting started on this Tuesday night. Back now with new details on the shocking death of Bob Saget. Tonight, police releasing never before seen images of the hotel room where the actor was found and the 911 calls leading up to the tragic discovery. NBC's Kristen Dahlgren has that new reporting. Tonight, police releasing new details and 911 calls from comedian Bob Saget's final moments. We have an unresponsive guest in a room. Saget's death still shrouded in mystery after he was discovered in his hotel room in January. Non-responsive, not breathing. Yeah, um, not responsive, not breathing, and no pulse. Police body cam video shows officers moments before entering Saget's room. It cuts off right before they enter, 
due to a decision made by a judge to block the release of the actor's death records after his family asked for privacy. An autopsy revealed the 65-year-old had died of trauma to the back of his head, most likely from an accidental fall. A heavily redacted police report released by the Orange County Sheriff's Office said the injury was likely caused by something hard, covered by something soft. Newly released police photos taken by investigators inside Saget's hotel room showing a padded headboard and the bed where his body was found. A pair of clothes hanging in the closet, his nightstand with his phone still charging. Saget's widow, Kelly Rizzo, speaking to Hoda Kotb days after his death. We valued every single second that we had together. So that's why it's, you know, this is so heartbreaking. But he was just the best man I've ever known in my life. A beloved figure's sudden and tragic death, leaving more questions than answers. Kristen Dahlgren, NBC News. All right, now to a major update in the homicide of a Broadway singing coach in New York City. 26-year-old Lauren Pazienza turning herself in after allegedly shoving that woman to her death. Marie Mahelis has the latest on that investigation. Hey, what did you do? Tonight, the suspect in the homicide of a beloved 87-year-old Broadway singing coach that shocked the city turns herself in accompanied by her lawyer. 26-year-old Lauren Pazienza, seen here leaving a Manhattan precinct, is facing manslaughter and assault charges for the death of Barbara Gustern. Elderly female assaulted. According to the NYPD, Pazienza allegedly approached Gustern from behind and pushed the 87-year-old, causing her to fall and hit her head. In an unprovoked, senseless attack. According to her grandson, she suffered traumatic damage to the left side of her brain. And five days later, he posted this photo of himself holding his grandmother's hand in the hospital, writing she had passed away due to her injuries. The motive behind the assault is still unknown. Surveillance stills were widely circulated by authorities in the days before she surrendered to police. The Manhattan DA's office alleges they have evidence Pazienza watched the ambulance arrive at the scene and shortly after deleted her social media. Pazienza's lawyer responded to the charges. They're absolute strangers and whether it was a push or whether it was a shove or whether it was a kick or whether someone tripped, the evidence is not very solid on that at all. There's a video of someone who looks like my, my client who's across the street in, or in the subway, but there's no video that shows what took place. This tragedy comes as major crimes in New York City are up 38 percent so far this year compared to last year. Hearing about it made me feel like I got hit on the head with a hammer. Gus Stern was a renowned vocal coach with various notable students, often performing on the stage herself. Sharp, clever, you know, seasoned New York person, you know, it's like, uh, she was amazing. Gustern had recently performed at Pangea and hoped to premiere a new cabaret show there. She was so wonderful. Um, she was encouraging, she was firm, she was the perfect teacher. Rahima Ellis joins us now live from 30 Rock tonight. You know, Rahima, this is just a truly sad story. It also speaks to a lot of what's been happening in New York City. At least people have been trying to connect those dots. I do want to ask you, do, do we have any idea what police have that they could charge this woman with that crime? And what's next for Lauren Pazienza? Well, the police are to say that they have 45 minutes before and after the incident that they reconstructed the suspect's movements. And so that's part of the material that had, they have in terms of charging her with this crime. And what's next for her, the judge in this case has ordered a psychiatric evaluation of the suspect who's being held on a half a million dollars cash bail and is scheduled back in court later this week. Tom? All right, Rahima Ellis with a lot of new reporting on this story. Rahima, thank you. When we come back, the deadly crash on an Oklahoma highway, a car carrying six high school students colliding with a semi truck. The cause of that accident now under investigation. Stay with us.
All right, back now with Top Stories News Feed, and we begin with a deadly crash involving several high school students in Oklahoma. Police say their car collided with a semi truck on a highway about 45 miles north of the Texas border. All six female passengers in the car were killed. No word yet on the condition of that truck driver. The cause of this accident is still under investigation. An out of control bounce house nearly missing a young child in North Carolina. Take a look at the video. It's from a home security cam. It captures the moment the bounce house gets blown off the ground, flying right by a five year old. The inflatable soaring two store soaring two stories in the air before crashing back down. No one was hurt in the bounce house at the time and no one was on the ground in front of that bounce house either. Phil Mickelson will not play at the Masters next month for the first time in almost 30 years. It comes after the famous lefty came under fire for saying he would support a Saudi Arabian golf league despite that country's record of human rights abuses. Many of his fellow pro golfers blasted those comments after the firestorm. The three time Masters champ said he would take a break from the game. And Amanda Bynes conservatorship is over after nine years. A California judge today terminating that legal arrangement. This is a recent photo of her. Both of her parents who acted as conservators saying they fully support the move. The former child star went into the conservatorship amid public battles with substance abuse and legal troubles. All right, next tonight, we want to return to our coverage of the war in Ukraine amidst the backdrop of the Russian invasion. NATO members are preparing to respond should Putin point his sights elsewhere in Europe. Courtney Kuby is in Norway with the latest on the alliance's military readiness. Tonight, troops from NATO countries are descending across Europe. 30,000 are now in a remote coastal corner of Norway, nearly 200 miles above the Arctic Circle. Today's scenario? Norway being attacked by another nation. NATO responds, invoking Article 5 of the 1949 treaty stating an attack on one of NATO's 30 members is an attack on all. The first and only time it was ever invoked was 9-11. On hand for today's exercises, troops from 27 countries. Most of these Marines just came ashore yesterday. Their mission, link up with other Marines and NATO allies to begin the part of the exercise where they attack the enemy. Simulated attacks coming from air, land, and sea. This is Cold Response 22, a military exercise where NATO partners must work together in frigid conditions. In the continental, you know, 48 states, weather is not as extreme as here in the high north, so um, getting us that exposure is really nice because there's a lot to learn, that's for sure. Today's drills were planned months before Russia's invasion of Ukraine. It's naive to think that it's not on people's minds, so. Absolutely, they're tracking it and so are we, but the exercise is completely separate. The dangers of operating in this type of harsh environment evident last week when an Osprey crashed during a training exercise, killing the four U.S. Marines on board. They know their best friends or remains are on their way back to the U.S. and their families are grieving. Here, the, the challenge as always is to stay focused on the training on the mission at hand. A mission preparing them for real world scenarios. And as the war unfolds in Europe, the stakes feel even higher. Tensions here in Eastern Europe remain extremely high. And while this exercise is conducted every other year, the Marines we spoke to here acknowledged that with the backdrop of the conflict in Ukraine, this year had a new sense of urgency. Tom? All right, Courtney QB for us tonight. Now to Top Stories Global Watch and the suspected terror attack in southern Israel. Police say a man rammed his car into a cyclist before going on a stabbing spree at a gas station and a shopping center in Beersheba. At least four people killed and multiple others injured. The suspect was then shot to death by a bus driver. Authorities believe the attack was terror related. And at least five people are dead after more flooding in Brazil. Video showing muddy water flowing through city streets. The flooding also causing mudslides. Several people are still missing at this hour. It comes after flooding in that region killed more than 230 people last month. All right, we turn now to the Americas where we focus on stories from the U.S. and Latin America. Cuban migrants are arriving at the U.S.-Mexico border in record numbers with thousands more currently making their way through Central America and Mexico. Meanwhile, conditions in Cuba are worsening. For many, the dangerous journey to the U.S. is the only option. Guad Venegas has more. A deadly river crossing to seek asylum in the U.S. For thousands of Cubans, it's the last step of a long journey. Benite. Under the cover of darkness, groups face the currents of the Rio Grande, avoiding Mexican officers unable to stop them. 
Others wait for daylight. This family bringing a child terrified by the water. The arrival of Cubans increasing by the thousands at the southern border after Nicaragua lifted all visa requirements last November. The change? Opening a new path, starting with a flight to Nicaragua and then traveling by land to the U.S.-Mexico border. Son miles los migrantes que están saliendo. Eh, actualmente, el, el mayor sueño de la juventud cubana es poder salir de Cuba. In Mexico, immigration officials recording a massive increase in Cubans entering the country from 6,000 in October to 9,000 in November and 11,000 in December of 2021. Two months later, the U.S. Border Patrol recording 16,000 Cuban apprehensions in February. That's the highest ever recorded for a single month. Most realize their life is at risk. In the past two weeks, Mexican officials say 15 migrants have died crossing the river in this area alone, south of Eagle Pass, Texas. Last week, a group of migrants, including Cubans, suffering an accident on the road, leaving three dead and 14 injured in Mexico, among them Aile Diaz, who's fighting for her life at this Mexican hospital. Her family in the U.S. now pleading for a humanitarian visa that would allow her to be transferred and treated in an American hospital. A return to Cuba for her would be difficult as the country faces medicine and food shortages. Miles de estas personas seguramente eh, no tienen otra salida. A esa crisis económica que irse del país. But for those deciding to leave without a U.S. visa, a long and uncertain journey awaits. All right, Guad Venegas joins us now. Guad, for the thousands who reach the U.S.-Mexico border, and we may be talking about tens of thousands shortly, what are their chances of them ultimately being granted permission to enter the country? Because these people are not only looking for work and medicine, they're also fleeing a, commun a communist regime there in Cuba. Right. So technically, because of our policy, uh, the border is closed to anyone seeking asylum at any ports of entry. That's why you see migrants crossing illegally into the U.S., uh, doing this, crossing the river, so that once they are in American territory, they can speak to Border Patrol agents and seek asylum. Now, at that point, the fact that Cuban uh, migrants come from a communist country and many of them have relatives in the U.S., these are all factors that do weigh in uh, that, uh, in most cases, allows them to remain in the U.S. while they go through the immigration process in the immigration courts. Uh, so for now, uh, this is the reason why many of them are taking this journey and crossing the river so that they can ask for asylum in the U.S., Tom. Guad Venegas on the refugee crisis that has been ongoing in Cuba for more than 50 years now. Guad, thank you for that. Still ahead, the desperate search for a missing 18-year-old. Police believe she was kidnapped. The new surveillance of the suspect just released. Stay with us. Back now with the latest on a missing woman we first told you about last week. Police now releasing new video of her suspected abductor as her family continues to plead for answers. Maura Barrett reports. Tonight, the search for the Nevada woman who went missing from a Walmart parking lot now being called a kidnapping. This is life or death for a beautiful and fun and amazing sister daughter and friend she was just she is, starting she is she is she's just starting her adult life she hasn't even gone to college yet she just graduated high school naomi irion's family desperate for more help she could be anywhere anywhere in the nation Police now in their ninth day on the case, releasing this surveillance video showing the suspect who they believe is involved with her disappearance from Fernley, Nevada, a small town 30 miles outside Reno. Investigators pairing this video with cell phone data, trying to find answers. Police say, according to Erion's cell phone data, she arrived at the Walmart parking lot at 5.09 a.m. last Saturday. Her last Snapchat sent at 5.23 a.m. One minute later, police say the suspect approached her car, got in, and drove off with Irion in the passenger seat at 5.25 a.m. While her car was found nearby, investigators say her phone pinged for a span of 10 minutes about five miles away from the Walmart, where investigators searched for several days, but they say there's been no phone activity since last Saturday. The uh, 
probability, I would say, of finding a person okay uh, greatly diminishes uh, with the passing of time. So that's why there's this high level of urgency to find anybody who has any information. Nearly 700 people gathering for a search party over the weekend and investigators still looking for this truck, which they believe the suspect is driving. The community leaning on each other for support. As soon as I saw it on Facebook, um, my first thought is I want to help. I want to do something. Another search planned for this Saturday, helping Erion's brother, Casey, hold on to hope. If they do it to us, they can do it to you. We need your help. This is a family. You have a family too. Maura joins us now from LA. Maura, walk our viewers through the next steps here in the investigation. Well, police are supportive, Tom, of these independent search parties that we've seen last week and the one planned for this Saturday. The community sporting rainbow ribbons because the family says Naomi's favorite colors were all the colors of the rainbow. When I spoke with her brother, Casey, he was overwhelmed by the support from the community. To put it into perspective, Fernley is a community of 20,000 people. So 700 people out searching at once is a huge chunk of their population. And combined with efforts from the FBI and local surrounding authorities, this is all hands on deck, Tom. Thanks so much for watching Top Story tonight. I'm Tom Yamas. Stay right there. More news on the way. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.